Chess Study Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Chess Study Podcast. This week, we're on episode two, and at least for this week, I'm just going to be posting it to YouTube. I'm looking into iTunes and SoundCloud, um, which I think would be pretty comprehensive because SoundCloud uh, allows a direct download of the podcast. I'll leave a comment for some feedback on what you prefer, and I'll see if I can get around to it. Of course, I'm not going to get around to everything, but I just want people to as mentioned before, have more options just to download it and listen to it outside of YouTube. All right, let's jump into question one. This is by Marku Cipolla. It says, if you have difficulty to join a club or play over the board, what do you think about online play with long time controls like 45-45? Okay, so if you really can't get to a club, then yeah, of course, you want to play long games. And the reason for that is because If you play blitz right off the bat, you can't develop your thinking process. The thought process is really what's what's becoming subconscious when you're playing long time control games because you can process the position. Now the brain learns slowly. You know, it doesn't it doesn't just get blitzed by information and absorb it all. Uh, You know, the nervous system really doesn't want to change. That's why, you know, people are inherently lazy and the brain especially. It doesn't want to make connections. So the way that you actually make connections is you sit there for a long time and you force your brain to focus on what's important. You know, if you blitz through a game and you don't analyze it with any significant amount of time, then you're not going to get those new connections forming and you don't get better basically. So if you play a long time control game, you know, it's better over the board. And the reason for that is because it's just a more focused environment. You know, all the distractions are gone. I find it hard to focus on a long time control game seriously at home. And you never really know if somebody's cheating or if they're checking an engine. Uh, There's always that temptation. There was a chess YouTuber I was following, a really good crazy house player. And even he admitted, he kind of... Uh, was shame shameful about it, but even he admitted playing um, at the higher end over uh, strong players in 45 leagues that he would just, you know, computer check stuff. So you really never know, although, you know, people can cheat over the board, but it's much less likely. Um, if that's your only option, then I would say do that. The shortest time control, if you're under 1500, should be 15 minutes. Uh, but really, you know, the longer, the better. And you need to do it with with regularity in order to get some benefit. All right, let's move on to question two. This question is, do you know if there's a formula to compare the strength of two players? Let's say one player is 1,400 rated uh, and the other 2,800. I know the factor is definitely not two, but what is the ratio? Is it 20 times stronger or 200? Then it says maybe it is really not that important, but might be interesting to know. Okay, so the interesting thing about chess strength is that a lot of people don't understand what it is. Uh, Like, why is Magnus Carlsen so strong? It kind of becomes a mythical thing. Well, it's, you know, once you're around my level, I guess you could say national master level even, then you really understand what it is. So, you know, a grandmaster, I guess a 2,500 grandmaster, um, they'll beat a national master simply because they just know a lot more concrete chess information. Now, People like Magnus Carlsen, they are extra special talents because what they do is they take all the information that a normal grandmaster would know and they kind of supercharge it and then they get creative with it where they can, you know, for example, Magnus Carlsen knows all the endings. So when he plays a super grandmaster, he can actually set traps within that knowledge uh, to decrease the, I guess, width Uh, the amount of moves that the player can make in order to not lose. So then they're kind of, you know, entering a shorter and shorter window to play accurately, and it's a lot easier to err in the endgame. And that's why his strategy works against the best players in the world, um, because he knows all this information about chess. And, of course, there's some creative talent there when it comes into play. But for your average grandmaster, um, they've just spent a lot of time over the board, basically honing their thought process and tactics. And they're really just masters of the basics. Like they take what I do, just, you know, knowing some very simple lines, being able to calculate, you know, two, three move variations, and they supercharge it and just do it at a higher level. That's really all it is. 
Um, you know, easier said than done, of course. It's really hard to get there because it's really hard for you to train your brain to think like that. Now, uh, you know, a 1400 player will, will see, you know, the world champion as God, you know, but they're really, you have to think we're playing a zero sum game here. There's no hidden information. So it's not like, you know, it's not like they're magicians or wizards, but it looks like that because they can use all these resources of opening knowledge, um, ability to calculate, and mostly I would say it's strategic understanding. That's the big gulf between um, a player like Magnus Carlsen and everybody else is that he can just, he understands um, what needs to be done in the position and you look at his games uh, against Nakamura, like objectively, they are actually like Nakamura, you know, he should not have a, like a, what is it, a minus 12 score. You know, he's won one game out of like 12 or 13 games against Carlson, which is just crazy for a player like that. Um, so if you look at just the score, you would think that, man, you know, Magnus Carlson is like a computer. Um, but actually in those games, if you look at the games, it's not necessarily that Carlson outplayed Nakamura. It's just that Carlson was able to lay some tricks, and for some reason Nakamura fell into him. That's just what happens. Um, so I wouldn't I wouldn't mythologize chest strength. I can I'm kind of reading into the question, I guess. You know, the of course we have the ELO, you know, the ratings, but they don't really tell the whole story. And I wouldn't just rely on ratings to judge somebody's chest strength necessarily because you know a grandmaster player some of them are really good at other things and they play to their strengths that's you know the development of chess style is kind of like that now i wouldn't say players at my level necessarily have a chess style because we're just trying to enforce the basics you know but the and the basics here is like knowing you know uh knowing opening lines and being able to calculate accurately and understanding positions. So it's just a gradual work in progress for all players, really. Um, and I wouldn't get caught up in, you know, what exactly a player of this strength is or that, because it does, you know, it is in flux, I would say. And especially comparing a player like from, you know, like if you look at the games of Lisa Lane, who was you know, U.S. I think a U.S. Uh, women's chess champion. Uh, she was quite famous in the 50s or 60s. And if you look at her games, probably a, a 1800 player today plays way stronger than she ever played over the board. I would say. You know, those kind of judgments are hard. All right, so let's get into the third question. Question three is: What is my opinion on playing gambits? Uh, so it says, if you are a young beginner player, maybe it's a good approach, but you're for but if you're an older but still weaker player, is this still a good idea? Like me, a cautious player, older player, who tries to go from the cold to e4 openings. All right, so basically playing gambits. Now, playing gambits is probably the best thing you could do if you're a weak player. Uh, how else are you going to learn how to play uh, complicated positions and positions with a lot of peace activity? So the positions that you really should be going for when you're learning are positions where all the pieces are in contact because if you just play positions that are safe and there's really no life in them then when you run into a very complicated position you're not going to be able to figure it out so you want to be training your brain stressing your brain with these positions where you're basically trying to be extremely aggressive now aggression and attack is a very underrated thing by a lot of weaker players um, where they think that if you simply play safe then you'll be safe but actually if you attack you're the most safe because your opponents really won't be able to deal with it and you'll be the one learning how to figure out how to attack and mate your opponent i would say there's different kinds of gambits there's two basic different kinds now there's theoretical gambits which are still gambits but they're actually very sound and two of those would be the smith mora gambit as white uh in a sicilian with e4 where you basically play d4 and then c3 giving up a pawn. That is a very underrated gambit uh, and very powerful against players up till I'd say grandmaster level. And the other one is the Banco gambit as black, where you play you know c4, d5, and then you play b5 um, if the opponent takes 
on b5, then you play a6, and you basically give away a pawn on the queen side. Now, of course, you have to know the strategy in these basic positions, or else you won't play correctly, but it's a perfect way to learn how to uh, start an attack. Now, the idea behind a gambit is you give away material for peace activity, which is a very sound idea when you're playing, and gambits basically force very lively positions. Uh, so I would think that if you see a player playing very cautiously in their 1200, they're probably not going to progress too quickly. Whereas if you see the player just going all out playing, you know, e4, e5, f4, playing the king's gambit, uh, the king's gambit, I would recommend you to play that exclusively uh, for a while and you'll learn a lot. I would say when I was about 1300 uh, strength or so, I played that for about three months and I beat a lot of uh, 1600, 15, 1600, 1700 players with the king's gambit um, just because they really didn't know what they were doing and well I guess neither did I but because I was very aggressive and it was kind of a shock value uh, but also during that time I learned a lot of how to play when you know there's a lot of threats on the board so it's a very educational thing to play gambits and I would certainly recommend it so question four is from uh, a Russian viewer I don't know how to say your name uh, but basically it says uh, let's see there's kind of a lot of questions in a question uh, but it says, I have mass troubles with some kind of paranoid searching of the best idea in the position, especially when I have plus two or more. Well, uh, welcome to chess. That that happens to me actually quite a bit. You're, you're up and you're doing well, um, but you don't know where to go. What you want to do in those kind of positions where you have an advantage is you want to try to trade down. Uh, now, I do that all the time now, and that's actually... I've, I managed to get my blitz rating up above 2100 again just by actually following that my own advice um, because I was having problems where I would get a winning position and then I would try to complicate it further. Don't do that. Just trade down, try to find you know opportunities to just trade pieces and your numerical superiority and advantage will lead you to a win and it also gives you some end game practice. In this question there's also what, kind of, what should be the thought process in different blitz time controls and how to adjust it with time management. So that's a very good question as well. Um, when you're playing blitz, the key priority is to not blunder. If you blunder your queen or a rook or a bishop, then you're going to have a lot harder time and it's a lot harder to defend than to attack. So basically when you play blitz, you just want to do a quick blunder check. And the key thing about blitz is you don't really use a thought process consciously or you shouldn't be otherwise you're not going to play very fast uh, the purpose of blitz is to play based on your intuition um, but the thought process should go something like this like you start a game and then you just play the first move and then before you play that move you just check to make sure it doesn't lose material that's your thought process in blitz you don't want really want to do what i'm recommending um, and long time controls, you don't want to, you know, figure out your your strategic thing or anything like that. Blitz does not going to train that. And actually, it's going to give you a lot of bad habits if you do try to do that. I would recommend that's why you play long time controls because you have the time to do that and actually train your, your thinking uh, process. If you don't train your thinking process, then you're really not going to improve because it needs to become subconscious for it to be effective. Now, when I played at Millionaire Chess, I did not consciously think I'll say that. Of course, you know, it. of course I thought, um, but it's, it's hard to describe. So basically what I'm saying is I did not say, here's step one, now I do this, now I do step two. Basically I had trained for four to five months very heavily up to a point, and then you just have to go and play. The training is the, basically what you need to uh, do. You need to train really hard so that when you do play over the board, or blitz, then you're not thinking, you're just playing. Because when you play a game, you need to play. If you actually try to consciously train while you're playing, you're gonna play a lot worse and it's not gonna work for you. So that's why I'm talking about like making videos about courses and stuff. Because when you do this training, that's not playing, there's a big difference. And I think a lot of players don't understand that, especially in my videos where I'm talking about these concepts and stuff. You're not, when you're playing a game, you need to play. So I, I think I need to get that across in this podcast. The four-step process, the thought process that I talk about here, 
you know, it's something that you need to train. And you'll see that all strong players do it automatically when they're actually playing. Uh, of course, you you know, mistakes happen. But that's why they, mistakes happen, because it's maybe some new position. But because they're not consciously doing it, then they they do make mistakes. Mistakes happen. When they do happen, then you need to go back to your training and figure out why it happens. And then you need to improve in the training, not when you're playing. So I hope that makes sense there. All right, so this concludes Chess Study Podcast Episode 2. Um, I think it's interesting to have this chess study podcast. If you have any more questions, please keep them coming. Um, I think there's a lot to cover in the chess study podcast, uh, and I'm just realizing that now, how many ideas that I can talk about. In the next episode, I'm gonna talk about some non-visual visualization things you could do to increase your chess strength, basically how you can train without a board. And that's going to be an interesting podcast too. So stick around for that and I'll see you in episode three. Thanks for watching. Bye. Thanks for watching Chess Diagnostic. I encourage you to subscribe and hit the bell so you receive all the notifications when I release a new video. If you want to support the channel, you can do so through PayPal, cryptocurrency, or you could check out the Chess Diagnostic apparel shop where I have all kinds of designs that I made myself. Uh, for t-shirts, hoodies, and I'll add new designs weekly. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the future. Everywhere that you want to.